So I, I had everything running and all the noise going on, so I thought rather than shut everything off, explain what I was about to do, and then turn everything back on, I would just show you what I did and then go back and explain it. So you're familiar with cutting binding with um, one of those little roller, roller bits that come up. Uh, and you know they're actually not into the bit but above the bit or below the bit and you can set the depth of your binding that way and so you can run it on as long as you have that bearing square to the surface or the edge of the guitar then you get a fairly consist consistent channel uh, it is tougher in areas like you know like in here to get you know because you got to stay square to that and you know so anyway I took that concept I'm not cutting a I'm not cutting a uh, binding channel, that would be a little extreme. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm thinning, this is the top to the 335, I'm thinning the um, this edge, right? This is your basically your edge, That this is the inside edge, right? Maybe I should back up a little bit on this, I'm just going to have to get closer to this cutter in a minute. But if you... Uh, if you can visualize this being the inside of the guitar. So this is your your thickness, your quarter inch thickness, which I am still almost a sixteenth proud of, or it measures pretty much right at five sixteenths. Um, so when I did the back, and I, I filmed some of that, and uh, I, I don't know how it's all gonna fall out here. If I remember I'll put it at this section rather than showing it you know when I did it which was previous to this I wanted to do the back first and uh, if I was going to make any mistakes I wanted to make them on the back because there were some dark streaks in the back which will be covered by the by the burst but I didn't want I didn't want that piece for the front and if I was going to mess something up I wanted it to be that piece so that if I had to replace it I would replace it with a better piece than even I had. So, uh, but it all worked out, and it's all glued to the rim, which you just saw previously. Um, so, uh, and that's why, if you notice that it had dark uh, streaks, that's why uh, I used it on the back. The um, so I've got this leading edge thinned down on the on the back. I did it freehand, so when you know I had the thing tied down, I just ran around it with a router and just niggled into the edge. Here. So. I thought, well, it would be more consistent to set up this kind of a little edge thing here. So picture that that uh, process I was talking about with binding. So the uh, and I didn't take this all in one one cut. So picture the right. I'm running on the edge of this piece of wood here, and I'm able to go around like this and keep a consistent edge as long as I keep square to the facer which is fairly easy to do since I kind of had two points coming out uh, past the, the cutter and then I also was able to push it into this half inch cutter so that I had a three eighths three eighths of an offset or this this looks huge in the camera on a close-up but this is only three eighths of an inch deep um, so yeah and then I did it in three three steps. So I came up about a quarter of an inch or less because this is three quarters. So yeah, I took three steps. So I probably took about an eighth to three sixteenths of a whack here. Uh, so just just did that all the way around it. And uh, I think because of the depth of the cut uh, into the into the wood this way, um, I didn't get a lot of chip out. I didn't get any chip out actually that I'm aware of. No, I, didn't, I don't see anything. So uh, that plus I was stepping up to it. Now when I first started I had it set too deep. I should back out again here. 
I had it set too deep and uh, into the wood, right? So that was like a full half inch. Uh, so I backed it out that eighth of an inch and got out to three eighths. Uh, that won't make any difference because by the time I, you can see the the outline here of where I'm going to be dropping down. I dropped down three millimeters for each step and there's three steps. So by the time I get to this outside edge here, which I start with, I go down nine millimeters from the top and then I go down uh, six millimeters from what's left and then I go down three millimeters on the top here. So you, you're you left with these steps, which then again I believe I, I already recorded when I did the back. Um, so by the time I get down that nine millimeters, this this little error will be uh, will be gone because it's going to come down to uh, you know below that notch. Anyway, so that's what this this little contraption was about was just holding me at a consistent depth off the cutter and allowing me to be able to to you know support this work uh, you know very solid rather than me just running around hand holding a router. I've also considered um, doing my routes, considered this, uh, but I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Because I did have an issue with keeping the router keeping the router up. You know, when you get out you're hanging off this 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 piece and you get out here and the router wants to dip. So I was uh, you know taping this down and then taping little support strips farther out, little outboard strips so that I could get work a section and then come back and work that section. So I'm going to consider this method. The problem is uh, I'm afraid that not being able to see where I'm going, I'm gonna it's gonna grab and want to keep pulling the material and I'm so I'll think about that. I'll probably end up doing this the same way I did on the back, which is just taping these down and then like I said, doing a little a little outboard piece stuck down here so that the router has support to a point and then taking that piece off and then finishing that that cut. So I think you can understand what I'm talking about here, or you can see what I'm talking about. Maybe too much info. Um, so if I have the router, I don't have it here because it's in the bench. Oh, I got it over here. This is the router I was using with a with a collar, a hinge collar on it. And so if you get out too far it's hard to hold this thing up and it wants to teeter on you. So if you have this little outboard piece taped down right there, you can take care of this little section and then pull that piece and then go back and take care of what's left. So anyway, uh, if I can figure out a way to do it so that it's completely supported on the table and, uh, and I won't be like chunking and grabbing, I'll go that route. guitar body even over the mahogany block it sounds hmm. interesting well and then the inside back up 
up a little bit. So. Got a couple spots where I'm gonna have to just scrape a little glue and uh, looks great. I am, I am pleased. Still got assembly tape on the outside of this thing where I kind of held things together while I was clamping them. Got my bent the sides. It's a little stick of little piece of tape here yet. Uh, but I would say that's a that's a half a guitar. All right. Drag me out If that's what this song is all about It's untangled tight Won't help my ambitious plans get right Hold a somber cheer Infectious screw Okay, so um, I left off with the uh, angle grinder with the flap wheel uh, doing some roughing in and, uh, and since then I've done a little bit of uh, playing with the little the Ibex. Um, I, anyway, so let me just try to show you so you can see there's definitely hard edges here, there were. I've, uh, I've taken most of the ones from the the midline here are just a little behind the waist and and pretty much gotten them blended uh, all in except for uh, right you can see like there's a hard edge here still on this top and a little bit of one around here uh, cut into here a little bit so up the sides here is pretty good I uh, don't have a lot of waviness it's pretty much just a nice gradual slope up uh, here because the spaces were farther apart you end up with these humps and uh, even though they're blended now I got a hump here and I've I got a hump here that I've been working on a little bit with the plane and uh, I got a hump here and then this hasn't been blended in yet either so um, before it's all done it will have to have nice you know uh, gradual slope and basically you come from a flat here to even maybe a little depression and then up to this slope see so got to have a scoop here. I've already got that here it's just that I know I'm not my final thickness on these edges yet so I'm gonna get myself close and then take the edge down and then blend everything. Um, I tried to get this this is a little cheap plane I've had in my drawer for years I don't even remember where I picked it up at but um, I, I sharpened the blade I thought that having a little longer plane between, you know, to, to if you can see, it's not hitting anything here, so it does hit the high spots more that way. But it's just not, it's uh, it's not really doing what I want it to do. I can actually take off a lot more material with this little ibex. So I'm back to that. The other thing, the other reason I was waiting on the front of this, um, 
I, I've complained about the plans I bought for this guitar already. Um, I'm going to continue to complain about the plans. So at any rate, they, they picture on the plans, they picture the neck actually coming uh, the, about a quarter inch above the actual top plane of the guitar, which if you were doing a complete neck pocket that took everything, you know, the full width of the neck, that would be fine. You can set the neck at different elevations, but typically these, this is like a less Paul in regard that the fretboard has to sit flush on top of the guitar, or at least that's what I was envisioning. Uh, the plans still aren't right because they're too much higher than the than the body of the guitar. The bottom of the fretboard is elevated at least a quarter of an inch, and um, and what? And I have uh, I found a good resource online. Of, of, I'll say a buddy of mine, a fellow YouTube guy, uh, Jason Beam, uh, turned me on to a website that has a lot of information on e uh, three fives and. Uh, uh, three, three, fives, three, fours, three, you know, three, four, fives, three, five, fives. Anyway, all that stuff and they have a really great photo library. And so I was able to, uh, to look at some pictures, you know, of these various years of three, three, fives from this angle, right? Looking across where the neck connects. And, uh, what I was kind of surprised to find is that, uh, the earlier ones, the 58s, and it's in the, in the, um, uh, in the text on the website as well, the uh, the earlier ones had a flatter neck angle than the later ones. So in '59, even they already had started increasing the neck angle, and consequently, what they've done is they pretty much meet the front of the guitar at the bottom of the fretboard. But then wherever this carve lines up, they don't try to carve that to where the fretboard is going to make perfect contact. What they've done is they've shimmed it. And if you're familiar with SGs at all. Uh, you look at an SG with uh, that has a neck angle, uh, and it will have a shim under the edge of the fretboard because Gibsons tend to have the tenon that comes in uh, shy of the fretboard edge, so the uh, the fretboard actually makes contact on a Les Paul with the top of the guitar. On uh, this style and SG styles, uh, other guitars they they actually put a wedge under the edge of the fretboard to to meet the the body of the guitar, so that you could theoretically. Uh, as long as you're meeting the the front edge here of the guitar with the bottom of the fretboard, you can change your neck angle and uh, and then you know get get appropriate neck angle. You'd have to fit it, of course. I'm not saying shim it or leave it gapped or whatever. I'm just saying once you arrive at your neck angle, you can then shim to suit with however the carve on the top of the guitar is. So I'm not. So I stopped because I wasn't sure about that, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting ahead of myself and carving the wrong angle on the top of the guitar because I wanted to make sure that I knew my neck angle was going to be and I was going to get all that lined up but according to the pictures I've been looking at that's not a critical uh, thing you just cut a shim to suit uh, after the fact just went and got a uh, little skid mat here so I could set this thing down and have it stay relatively flat uh, not scoot around on me so anyway it's really I'm, uh, I'm just going to go around and you know keep working out. I've already I've already planed off these edges a little bit over here, and uh, and they're they're feeling pretty good. I got a slight rise right there, as long as uh, anyway that's a good place for me to stop on that. So, but around here I've got a pretty good pretty good little hump right in here still. I've got some reverse grain right here. So I got a little area there I'm gonna have to turn around. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, um, I 
I watch a lot of YouTube. I like to see what other guys are doing and how they approach things. Uh, I'm not going to you know, sit here and tell you that I'm a master carver because I've done I've done a few carved. I've probably done four carved tops. Started my first carve was a Les Paul. Um, that feels pretty good. Over here. Anyway, uh, so I was watching. I'm reminding myself right now in the video to uh, to look this guy up and and get his name because he. He did a an octave mandolin, and I watched him do his carve. And he actually started on the inside um, of it, and uh, that for some reason made sense to him. Uh, it to me it seemed backwards uh, because, well, for one thing, he had the completely uh, you know hollow inside carve. He didn't have a center beam, and so uh, he could. Uh, predetermine his his arc and make a template and then that's what he did and he went back in and he cut grooves uh, you know across and made sure that his different templates matched that radius uh, that, that he carved a radius to match the template so anyway then he went and he he did the drill bit thing where you put a you put a pin in your in a, you know on your drill press and then you come down to it and you set a pre predetermined uh, dimension and I have that set up in my bit in my press right now but I'll show you to that show that to you later at any rate to me I thought I'd much rather get the the top shape nailed down and then flip it over and drill the inside because if I'm going to have any irregularities I want them to be on the inside of the of the car not the outside uh, so now for this little bit that I've been standing here talking to you, I've already worked that down quite a bit and I like I like the way it feels already. So that's not too bad. I do have this area here where I'm not sure it's going to want to cut uphill either. i got to find it. That looks different from backwards. Well, that's stupid. Oh, it's down here. I was looking at the wrong section. Right, there you go. Still in here? Yep. So, that one little bit right there just doesn't want to cut. Going the other way. Alright, so that feels real good. Now I've got a ridge. I got this ridge right here at the bottom, so I'm just going to go around and get that off. Then I got the same problem here with a little bit of chip out, same, same basic grain line. There. Just a lot of back and forth with this. Take a little material off and, and then you know feel it. That already feels pretty good. It's a little high yet. I got my hand in the way the whole time. Anyway, I'll do this for a while and then I'll I'll probably get to where I feel like it's pretty close and then I'll hit it with a random orbital and, and uh, work that in. And then, you know, once it gets really smooth with that, then you can really tell if you've got irregularities in the car. And you just go back and touch up and hit spots and just keep working it out until you like it. Um, It's still got a little bit of a rise, a hump, whatever you want to call it.
Okay. So that whole section already doesn't feel too bad. I'm just going to keep doing that. And it's, a, you know, it's kind of a slow process. Um, but uh, you just be patient and keep at it. And uh, the work, last thing you want to do is get in a hurry and take too much off, uh, which is, I'm afraid I'm always going to do, because once you got it off of there, you can't put it back. All right. I'm going to turn you off, just work on this well, bring you back in in the well, and uh, catch you up, and we'll see where I'm at with it. I'm going to start working around this area and blending these uh, hard edges in, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Drag me out If that's what this song is all about It's untangled tight Won't help my ambitious plans get right home A somber cheer An infectious groove Souls what it will soothe Radiant love It's not really what we once thought it was Hope A somber leer Wait for me here folks I, uh, I have no idea I have no idea when this thing uh, went off because uh, I haven't reviewed that part of the video yet but I um, I do know that uh, I was carving and at some point the I looked up and the and the card was full in fact let me look up now yeah no it's running okay <laughs> I just saw a red dot and that's what it does when the cards full so anyway um, so which is silly, right? It's a red dot for reporting and a red dot for full uh, on the card. So, but I, um, where's my, so I pretty much, you know, I think when I left you, the last thing I had said before I just let the video run out was, um, that, you know, I was just trying to work these, there's little lumps from, from the, uh, you know, the different steps that we had in the original card. And so it got pretty good. It feels real good. Most of it, there's still, and then there were still little areas that were just you could tell they weren't even. So what I did was I just put a really, really shallow cut on the on the little plane here, and so it's just barely just nicking high spots basically, right? And so I I went all over the thing with that, and uh, you know pretty much took off any little you know any any places that were high. And I'm not sure you can see, but I'm just barely getting any any kind of curls off of it at this point doing that. Then the other thing I did, uh, yeah, and I went this way too, because as you go downhill, you end up with little, you know, it's a curved blade, so you end up with little, uh, where is it at? There you go. You end up with little uh, divots in between each run down, you get it, and then it always wants to go back into the same groove and run down because it's got the little ridges so it's like 
getting stuck in a tire rut, you just keep repeating the same thing. So I'll go the other way too, and that, that helps flatten those out. But I've got it set so light, I don't know, it's probably going to be really loud me talk, trying to talk over that. Um, so I've got it set really light, so it's just barely whisking the tops of these little things off. And that's, that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. And I've got a couple places where it's really abrupt still, uh, like right here, because I brought this up. And so right here, I've kind of got like corners, so those will, those will, get, those will go away. Um, I brought this section down. These were really sharp little ridges right here, and I've just planed those off uh, to the same height. So they're flat now, but they'll, they'll just round over uh, pretty much there, and that'll be good. I even... Uh, even got a pickup ring out and measured up where my fretboard is going to land. And this isn't the fretboard because the fretboard I'm going to use is uh, will be a ro this is a Bolivian rosewood. Uh, what's the technical? I, I can never remember the real name for this. Anyway, um, so a couple inches up off the end of the guitar, and then the pickup ring. This is the rear pickup ring because it's tall, but it's going to be right in that area and oddly enough it's almost completely flat in that area already. I have worked this down a little bit here but surprising and I will I will conform the pickup ring to fit wherever the top ends up at so that's not an issue. Then the other thing that I've been looking at and checking as I go is um, I made a template when I was carving the back of the the back radius. Let me get that template in the screen here. And uh, so, and just go right over the center and I we can get, yeah, there we go. So you can see that I'm running pretty, get down there on the end, I'm running pretty good on my template. You can see there's a couple highs or lows. Uh, I'm not that extremely worried about it. Uh, right here up at the, up where that pickup ring the front of the pickup or the end of the neck you can see is touching right there. So I'm going to flatten that out a bit so it's closer to what the template's doing. And um, yeah, I'm going to just keep going at this until it gets, uh, oops, sorry, until it gets smoother, which is the whole idea and process behind this. And then, of course, once I get comfortable with how the top is feeling, um, then uh, I will flip it over and we'll go to the drill press and we'll we'll drill all the holes in the back uh, and then gouge the majority of that out and then get that little hand plane out again and go for it. A little finger plane I should say. So what else? One other thing to discuss and I also don't know if that's going to be something you can really see in there or not. Uh, maybe. It's kind of that dark edge you can see around here and that's actually just a cut that I put in there. My little homemade uh, uh, marking gauge. Let me see where it went. Oh, here it is. Uh, this is something I made when I was doing the, um, I'm trying to think of the brand of that guitar, the Washburn guitar that had the gash in the side. Uh, I did this as a, uh, as a binding uh, channel marker. But I set this thing at a quarter inch. Now this, I just made this out of a screw and a little, little block of mahogany, trying to get in the camera. I don't know why this is so hard to figure out. Maybe because I'm doing it from the side left-handed. There we go. Uh, so you can see this is a screw. If you know anything about uh, cabinets and hinges and things like that, this is basically a little hinge screw for a Euro recessed hinge, pocket hinge. Um, I sharpened the back of this on the drill press. I just chucked it in the drill press and filed the back out. Uh, actually, I used my Dremel with a little uh, a little round cutter in it, and so I just spun it and cut from the back. So this is a sharp edge on this screw here. And uh, like I said, I just set it at a quarter inch. And I ran around the whole, whole guitar top and scored it and so I can see exactly what I have left. So I have a pretty good line that I'm going to end up um, uh, planing that down to all around the perimeter. And so I've just been working inside the perimeter and I've got a little dish, a really slight dish right here. 
And so by the time I get this this worked out this way and then I take this down to the line, it's going to come down right smooth into it. And I wouldn't even mind ending up with a little bit of a dish right here. So coming off the edge and then dishing a little bit and then going up, I'd be perfectly happy with that. Uh, I'd actually prefer that. So um, we just see what happens if I get I get a hit perfection or if I get burned out first. But I'll, I will I will get it perfect because I'm just, that's the way I am. I don't do close very well. Anyway, so that's what I'm doing, and uh, I am um, I'm going to deepen this up just a little bit. I'm going to keep doing this for a while on the shallow cut because I'd really just just work it this way for quite a while and uh, make sure I'm not taking too much off. And. Uh, Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Just, just get all the weird little lumps off of it, and then I'll probably make the cut a little heavier and go around the whole thing again, do some more dishing out around the edge, and then start working the perimeter down because uh, I got to take about a 30 second more material off of this outside edge yet to, to be right there. So, And I'm going to have to make that heavier. Oh, the other thing I did, <laughs> try to remember everything that happened after the camera went off and it might have been on there for all I know I'd like so I haven't reviewed it yet um, I got I just I just took one of my uh, fret one of my uh, fret leveling blocks uh, this is a short one uh, and I just make my own instead of buying the metal beams that have been ground uh, nice block of mahogany like this and run it through the joiner uh, and every so often I'll just peel all the sandpaper off of it and run it back through the joiner make sure things are straight. Um, so all I did here, the same thing, I had the line on the front. Uh, okay, it's in there somewhere. The line in the front, which is almost exactly down to the line right here. So I just uh, I sanded and checked and sanded and checked and what I did was I just uh, Flattened, flattened this front of face of this hump out so that I had a good angle there and I've just been running that and it actually it was sanding pretty straight and I flipped it around sanded this so this would be flat and straight up here so that I get a good true line back on this end again after I turned it around so I just did that I worked it back and forth a little bit and now I have a really good uh, nice flat straight uh, front edge here and uh, like I said, though, I probably will flatten this out a little bit right in here because this is where that pickup, uh, the, uh, I shouldn't say the pickup, this is where the, the contour uh, profile gauge that I made off the plan is uh, showing it to be a little high right in here. So I'm going to work that down a little bit. So we'll come up off of here and then we'll swoop up to that. Um, but anyway, I know I'm good in this front edge now. That's the main thing. I wanted to make sure my thickness was good here. So, I think, I think we're caught up. And I probably...